introduce Dr. Glor briefly. He's a professor of biochemistry. He has broad experience in molecular biology, genetics, and genomics. And most recently, he's developed some tools to investigate the fundamentals of molecular evolution, microbial ecology, and metatranscriptomics. He's currently working on developing and adapting principled methods to characterize correlation and differential abundance in sparse high throughput sequencing data as generated in 16S RNA gene sequencing surveys, metagenomics, and metatranscriptomics. So I will turn it over to you, Greg. Greg will speak for about 35 minutes and then we'll open it up. So take it away. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, this is, thank you all for. Uh, attending. This is my first webinar. I usually uh, am in, in front of a, a, a lecture hall or, or, or something like that. So hopefully this works for everybody. Um, the slides will be up uh, publicly. Um, the, the location for my slides are always located uh, at the bottom of this title slide. So I'm going to be talking about um, basically uh, methods that are, that are generalizable to any dash sequence omics uh, uh, approach. But just, I'm sure everybody knows about the microbiome, but just to reorient, basically we, we're trying to understand how the microbiome interacts with the host. We are really a meta-organism. We have um, about the same number of microbial cells as human cells, and there's a lot more gene functions, that is that the, there are a lot more functionality in the human microbiome, especially in the gut, than there is in our own genomic um, uh, information. So the microbiome, of course, is, is, is hugely important. So I'm gonna start off and talk about, about problems with microbiome analysis. And so the first question is, is, is microbiome analysis reproducible? And I'm gonna argue that it's as currently constituted, it's not particularly reproducible. This is a famous example from uh, where, uh, where journalists sent the same gut sample, same stool sample to American Gut and to Ubiome, and basically got back completely different answers. Uh, the, the relative composition of uh, their stool sample was very different. And so then, Really, this became the, 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 the rationale to, to um, start working on reproducible methodologies, and there's a number of different groups that are, 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 that are working on this, including the Microbiome Quality Control Consortium, um, of which I participated in. And so I'm going to try and explain why I think there's, some, there's so much variation in the, in the results, and then try and give you a solution uh, that should be generally applicable. Part of it is the, is, is, goes back to the, the, the importance of an analysis plan. So prior to 2000, um, people did not have to, uh, who during clinical trials, did not have to register their trials. And what happened then was that you were getting about two thirds of the trials, and this is trials on pharmaceutical and dietary supplements. You could, it wouldn't matter what, what the subject of the trials were. The, prior to 2000, prior to registration, Basically, two thirds of the trials gave a result that was "quote unquote" significant. In the, in the year 2000, these trials had to be registered, and people had to then register what they were going to collect, how they were going to collect it, how they were going to analyze it, and what their outcomes were. And as soon as that happened, the number of successful trials dropped from dropped to about 10 percent of registered trials. And the reason for this is that now people could no longer dredge through their data and find anything that looks significant. They had to pre-decide what, uh, what they were going to be looking for. So I'm going to show you that microbiome analysis fits, is, is, is definitely in the we're just fishing uh, sphere. So here's sort of a schematic of a number of, a number of the approach, a number of the approaches that go into an experimental design in a, in a microbiome data set. And so I'm going to call these researcher degrees of freedom. So if you, depending on how, on how you collect your sample, whether it's a swab stool or toilet paper, for example, or any other, so the dots underneath represent, and so on, how you store it, whether you store it at, at room temperature, different temperatures, or whether you use a preservative or not, 
which kit you use to isolate, whether you bead bead or not, which if you're doing 16S amplicon sequencing, which variable region you amplify, how you set up your barcodes, are they inline, offline, are they, are they uh, combinatorial, or are they only single-sided, which sequencing platform, and which uh, software that you're using to process the, the, the result. So you can see that there's a tremendous variation in the approaches that people can use. So it might be no wonder that microbiome analyses between labs might not be reproducible. But even within a lab, the different labs, the same lab will use different paths through this at different times. The researcher dis dis degrees of freedom extends to the analysis, and it's probably even worse here. So whether you're like, whether you're doing uh, open or closed OTU picking, or you're using actual sequence variants, whether you're using any one of a number of different databases, including some that, that you make yourself. A lot of people make their own databases for their particular uh, uh, microbiome tissue that they're that they're that they're looking at. Whether you're using a point estimate or a maximum likely estimate, estimate, or you're using a Bayesian approach, how you transform or if you transform your data, um, a lot of discussion in the microbiome field now as to how you should be properly transforming your data, which distance metric you're using, and here's where the here's where I think problems really start to creep in. It's very common in the microbiome field. In fact, I would challenge you to find me a paper that doesn't do this, where they'll, they'll you know, figure one will be, they will show, or figure 1A will show an unweighted unifract distance, figure two or figure 1B will show a weighted unifract distance, and then conclusions in figure three will be decided on a, on a Bray-Curtis or a Jensen-Shannon divergence. So what, you're, what people are doing here is they're choosing methodologies that give them the answer that looks right to them, not something that's actually principled. This extends also to differential abundance testing. There's, a, there's a, a whole slew. I've just given a few here. And then to correlation. Um, and so, again, people will use a tool that gives them an answer that looks reasonable to them. The approach that I'm going to show you is, uh, is a principled approach that's based upon a sound mathematical and theoretical foundation, as opposed to many of the other tools which are, to be honest, quite ad hoc. So it's a, it's showing, what I'm going to show you, walk you through in the, at the bottom, is a Bayesian probabilistic approach that's based upon log ratios and then uses tools and distances that have a firm mathematical foundation. So this makes it generalizable. So I'm going to tell, so I, we have a big problem. And, 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 you know, really, is it any wonder that different groups can get, can get different answers about the same system? And so, you know, you can have... Um, completely different taxa that are that are causative quote unquote for you know choose your favorite disease um, and is, is it really any wonder that so many data sets are, are irreproducible and really the problem stems from the from the fact that there's so much variation in the human microbiome and really there's no standard of truth and people feel that they need to be first rather than be I'm, I'm going to say correct so here's kind of a way out. If we look at, for example, this is an old paper, um, six years is, is, a, is a lifetime in the microbiome field. This is an old paper, a figure from an old paper that shows that on the left side, as you're facing it, on the left side you can see the microbial composition of, say, tongue or feces at the phylum level. So just focus on tongue at the moment. We can see that, that basically the tongue can be pretty much anything from um, almost exclusively from acutes to largely proteobacteria at the composition level. At the functional level, there is a lot less diversity. And the same thing holds true for, the, for, 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 for stool samples on, on the bottom, so be comparing BMD. So what we have here is that the is, is the idea that functionally the bacteria microbes can uh, compensate for missing taxa, or another way of put another way to think about it, of course, is that um, what the, the gene content of a bacterial species is very fluid, and so um, 
the total gene content is probably a better descriptor of what the functional capacity of the microbiome is than what taxa are actually there. So one way out of this is to, is to start looking at function rather than composition. And I'll show, um, uh, show our approach in the, uh, at the end. So if we want to get at mechanism and get at function of the meta-organism that we are, we have to stop, this is, we have to stop thinking about targeted amplicon sequencing, which is the vast majority of data, data uh, that's collected today, and to move to or more functional omics, like metagenomics, where we're collecting all the genes in, a, in, a, in an ecosystem, metatranscriptomics, which is, which is examining which of those genes are expressed and at what levels, uh, proteomics or metaproteomics, um, and metabolomics, the small molecules that are collected, uh, that are used and produced um, in, in, by the ecosystem. So the problem is that targeted amplicon sequencing appears to be really, really simple. It appears to be really quick, and it seems to be informative, but it's really not. And metagenomics, metatranscriptomics, metabolomics are hard to analyze. So they're hard to, meta, so I, this is a metatranscriptomics, and metatranscriptomics, as an example, are really hard to analyze because the, the composition of the bacterial species across samples can differ. The gene content in exactly the same species can be different. And the gene expression in the, of those genes that differ between species can also differ. And so we, we end up in a situation where everything looks different but at some level, something has to be invariant. So here's an example of a, of a metatranscriptomics. This is an example of a metatranscriptomics of a bacterial vaginosis experiment that, that, that we have, where analyzing it using standard approaches, um, maximum likelihood-based uh, approaches, basically says that everything's different. And so what we're looking at here is uh, it's a tool called EDGAR. I get the same, experience, same results if I use DEC2 or DEC or EDGAR or VOOM or LIMA for those of you who are familiar with those tools. What we're looking at here is, is what EDGAR has called significantly different, and these are points in red. So each point is an individual function in, an, in the vaginal ecosystem. The red points are those that are differentially abundant. The black are those that are not. Uh, yellow are those that are different, that are um, uh, sparse, so they have a zero in one or more samples. What should happen if this tool is working properly is that that red line, which shows the center of mass of difference between the groups, should be a straight line centered on zero. And, and what it's saying is that basically probably four-fifths of the functions that are in this ecosystem are different between the two groups. So we're in a situation where if everything is different, nothing is useful. And that's, this is clearly um, not a useful way to, to, to examine these data. And really, for, for anybody who's a statistical wonk out there, the, 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 the assumptions that are being broken by this tool are that the majority of features, more, the majority of functions are invariant. It's basically saying everything's different. And dispersion is a function of abundance and the data are centered. We can see that the data are not on the center line. So any model that's built that, that this tool uses is, is, is clearly off the mark here. So how do we start to analyze this? And so now I'm gonna go back to first principles and explain exactly what sequencing is and what sequencing is not and show you how this, why this, this changes things. The problem with high throughput sequencing is that essentially no matter what experimental design you throw at it, whether it's a uh, amplicon sequencing, metagenomics, metatranscriptomics, transcriptomics, chip seek, in vitro selection experiments. No matter what you throw at a sequencer, you get sausage out at the end. You get exactly the same thing out. So imagine we have a cell population, three cell populations on the, in the top right, one, two, and three, and we only have two genes. Just to keep it really, really simple, we only have two genes. At, in total count, they differ. But if we look at the data after sequencing, we can see that samples two and three look exactly the same. And the reason for this 
is because what we imagine sequencing is, is it's a random sample like an election where we actually count the number of people that vote. And that's some random sample of random or non-random sample as, as it may be. It's, it's, you know, people that want to vote are different than the people that don't vote. But anyway, it's a, it's some random sample of the population where we actually count things. And so we, if we have a, a uniform field of animals, tigers, ladybugs, space aliens, and rabbits, we put down some kind of um, transect and we count the number of things that are inside. This is what the tools that people typically use imagine is happening when we sequence. But what is actually happening is somewhat something rather different. Sequencing instruments have a capacity. So you can't, for example, make a library and put it on a, an aluminum MySeq, which gives 25 million reads, and expect to get 2 billion reads, which is what you would get from a, an Illumina Nova Seq. That just clearly can't happen. So the, the, the machines have a capacity. So what we're actually doing is more like filling the squares on the checkerboard. And so if we have two molecules that sit down in the same checkerboard, we have to randomly choose which one we're going to sequence, and the other ones are ignored or discarded. This is, this is how sequencing actually works. It's more like conducting a political poll where you, 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 tr you collect exactly, you tr collect a thousand people and you're getting a proportion. So rather than counting, which is what traditional um, RNA-seq and microbiome sequencing experiments, uh, analysis tools expect, what we have is a probability of the count given the sequencing depth how, you know, how, good, how much money you spent on sequencing, and the underlying frequency in the population. So we have, we, we have to think about our data in a, in a way that's a little bit less um, familiar to us. And to drive this point home, here's what data in the environment would look like as counts. So I'm modeling ladybugs and tigers, um, or, or, or so on, and they're uncorrelated. In a multivariate sense, they fill a volume. And here, please imagine that I am, I am holding this square above my head, okay, and rotating it around. So you can see that those points are randomly distributed throughout that volume. This is, again, this is in a multivariate sense, this is what our data are like in the environment that we want to understand, okay? But after sequencing, these same data are very different. And it's at this point, if you've ever done microbiome analysis, that the hair in the back of your neck should be standing up because you realize that after sequencing, the relationships between the different things that you're looking at is very different than it is in the underlying environment. And what's happened here and is that the data have gone from that multivariate volume onto a plane called a simplex that cuts through the middle of that volume. Now, I've, I've got here that we're looking face onto the simplex, and we can see that we have a plane with three vertices because we only have three uh, things that we're looking at. And so if you're analyzing your data, expecting counts, and you've actually got data on this simplex, you are getting the wrong answer. It's just a matter of how wrong you are. Okay? So, so here's... Fundamentally, we have to imagine that we're, we have to work on this simplex in a proper way. This problem does not go away if we have 20,000 features or 300,000 features. It just, it just means that we're working on a plane with one fewer dimensions than, than the number of features. Okay? We can't get off the simplex. Conceptually, this is why people normalize their data. So here's the one popular normalization in microbiome and transcriptome is the DE-seq normalization. The DE-seq normalization makes the problem worse, not better. If, if there, on the left is our numeric data, I've highlighted two, two samples. In the center is proportional data, data on the simplex for those same, uh, the, 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 uh, with the same two samples highlighted. And after DE-seq normalization, um, it just makes the problem worse. We've actually gone from a simplex to a geometric space that we have no idea what's going on. So it, 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 uh, 
the data that we get back are really have after normalization has nothing to do with the numeric data in the ecosystem. And once we're on this simplex, we can't recover it unless you spend a lot of time, about 10 times the amount of money, and a lot more effort. So it's, this is a, this is a one-way street. So what we actually have when we sequence is something called compositional data or, or, or coda. And compositional data has been known forever. So William Pearson, back in 1896, wrote a number of papers that said that if you have data with a common index, which is what um, we have in, se in sequencing, that you should not do correlation, PCA, or any of the other tools that were de being developed back then. So it's set in 1896 by the leader, the person who developed a lot of the statistical tools that we, that we commonly use. And he was completely ignored for about 100 years. Uh, in the mid 80s, a guy named John Aitchison came up with a, uh, a methodology that, that allows us to get an answer on the simplex that we can relate directly to the underlying environment. And it, for those of you who are wet lab people and have done quantitative PCR, conceptually what we're doing is we're taking high throughput sequencing data and converting it to something that's very similar to quantitative PCR. So if we have, we're down at the bottom, the only equation I'm going to show, if we have a, down at the bottom, we have a vector of counts X, which corresponds to the counts for, say, genes in a given sample from, and we have uh, D genes. What we do is we take the geometric mean of those, of those counts or a subset of them, and then we uh, transform it using the log ratio method down at, the, down at the bottom, where we take the ratio between feature X and the geometric mean, and then take the logarithm of that. That's it. That's, that's kind of the secret. What happens now is that we're still on the simplex, but we can, in principle, get the same answer with the data um, after sequencing as the data from the environment if we treat the data from the environment with exactly the same transform, which we can't do with any other, any other, other transforms. So I'm going to cut, sum up the theory with, with a little, uh, with a, a quote that Donald Rumsfeld did not make when he was justifying the, getting the, the Americans uh, into the Iraq war, the famous no one knowns, no one unknowns, and unknown unknowns quote, but he, as a true politician, he left off the one that really gets people in, in trouble, which is when we think we're doing the right thing, but we're not, the unknown knowns. These are the things that we think we actually know that we actually don't. We, we think we know how to analyze these data, but we don't, and it, it's that's the kind of thing that gets people into trouble. Okay, so I'm gonna, gonna go to bacterial vaginosis and show you the approach and the robustness of it. So just to remind anybody who doesn't know anything about bacterial vaginosis, it's a, a, a dysbiosis of the, of, the, of the vagina. It's the most common reason for a woman to go see her family physician. So it, um, and it's associated with uh, preterm labor and um, STD transmission. Two conditions, health is back predominantly lactobacillus species, bacterial vaginosis is a mixed bag of anaerobes with a, uh, one or more uh, minor components of lactobacilli. So there's a marked asymmetry in composition, but in order to do the analysis, we can either say everything's different, in which case, why do we do the, why do we do the, do the experiment, or we have to assume something is invariant. And so this is pulling from that bioinformatics slide uh, early on. This is the CODA approach. It's backed by a firm theoretical foundation. Um, it, no, nothing in this approach is ad hoc. Everything's internally consistent. If I do differential abundance, I will see the same result um, uh, in a correlation analysis, or I will see the same result in a multivariate ordination. It's probabilistic, so it's a, it matches the type of data that we get from sequencing, and it's robust. Upstream decisions have little effect. We can get the same answer even if we sequence on different platforms, and I'll show you that uh, at the end. This is our data set, our sample set by 16S rRNA gene sequencing. Uh, on the left are the healthy samples. We have each bar is a, is a person or a sample. Each color is a different taxon. And they use the same colors all the way all the way throughout. 
we can see that the healthy has two different types of, uh, of, of lactobacilli in them, and they separate very cleanly by 16S. The BV, it looks like a mixed bag of who knows what, okay? Really a mixed bag. And sort of the dogma, or not the dogma, but you know the, the received wisdom in the field that from uh, high throughput sequencing is that there are three or four different kinds of ways you can be healthy depending upon the dominant lactobacillus, but BV is just this mixed, mixed bag of things. I'm gonna try and show you that that's not the case. So what we did is meta-transcriptomics, or bacterial mRNA seq. We collected the samples, we purified bacterial mRNA, and we sequenced the crap out of it. And then we did two things with those associated reads. One is we, we aligned those reads to reference genomes that, uh, of organisms that should be in the, in, the, in the vagina, and anything that didn't, uh, didn't match to a reference genome we assembled. We then merge these two data sets into reference sequences. Those are sequences that are 90% identical, regardless of whether they were assembled or referenced. Um, uh, and then we use that as our, as our starting set. Mapping the reads back to those reference sequences, we can then infer which organisms those, the reads and the reference sequences belong to, or we can group them into uh, functions, that is, for example, the, all the genes, no matter what organism that, that they belong to, that, that for example, make glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase or encode, and encode that, get grouped down to one enzymatic function. So there's about 300,000 reference sequences and about 4,500 functions. So first thing, abundance by 16S doesn't tell us much about function. So as an example, if we look at adipobium, which is this cream-colored one by 16S, we can see that it can compose between 5 and, I don't know, 20% of uh, the ecosystem. Mapping the reads, essentially adipobium is present, but it's transcriptionally silent. And we can see that over here. So here's the, the relative abundance of adipobium. Um, by 16S and by mRNA. By mRNA, it's, it's, it's a vanishingly small fraction. Um, other organisms, you can see, like Megasphera in green, we're going to come to Megasphera a few times, it's one of my little favorite organisms. Um, uh, by 16S, it's relatively rare. By um, mRNA fraction, it's relatively abundant. So Megasphera typically punches above its weight. I'm going to show a lot of these, or a, a bunch of these principal component plots. So when we've done the log ratio transform, principal component analysis becomes a really valuable way to do exploratory data analysis. And we're looking at the variance of the ratios of the reference sequences, and we are plotting both the samples and the reference sequence variation on the same plot. So each point is colored, is, is an individual reference sequence, and they're colored by the inferred organism that they come from. Each sample is named, and the, so the, the samples, we can say that the, the, the distances between samples corresponds roughly to the multivariate distances between them. So first thing that's really kind of interesting here is that we see that the reference sequences for a that map to a given taxon, for example, up here is lactobacillus inners, tend to cluster quite rather tightly. And the, another interesting thing is that lactobacillus inners has, any individual isolate, has about 11 or 1,200 genes. There are about 20,000 ref sequences that cluster in the inners, um, in the inners cluster, indicating that the pan genome for inners is much larger than any individual genome. So that's, I mean, it's not maybe not surprising, but it, you can really see how how that uh, plays out uh, here. And you can the same thing makes make, uh, happens for all the other pan, uh, pan genomes as well. The samples also cluster, and we we think that there's basically four clusters. So uh, functionally, at the at the ref seq level, we see four, or we see two different healths, the same health by that they group by 16S group by reference sequences, and they, this is largely by species composition. In BV, we don't have a uniform distribution. We have two distinct groups, a BV1 down here and a BV2 down here, uh, up here, 
And the BV1 has many more of these black genes, which are genes that we assembled out of the transcriptome. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. If we look at just BV, so if we subset the data, the BV samples separate the same way. And this is something that typically doesn't happen in, in typical analysis. When you, when you start subsetting the data, you start getting different answers. So you can subset it any way you want, and you'll get you know, some answers that you can always publish. So again, it's the same samples that, that separate, and it's the same driving reference sequences that are separating BV1 and, and, and BV2. The other interesting thing about this is that we can separate individual pangenomes of the same species. And so here, for example, in green are two pangenomes that map to Megasphera. And essentially what this means is, is that we have two different species, or probably more likely, two different strains of Megasphera where the pangenomes are behaving independently. And we see the same thing for Prevotella in purple. We have several different pangenome behaviors for, for Gardnerella, two different pangenome behaviors for the, refer for the reference, sequence, reference sequences that were assembled, et cetera. So this is what we can get from the, um, from the reference sequences. So these are massive sparse data sets, 300,000 reference sequences. They, they, they group by taxonomy, and we can have multiple independently behaving strains or whatever you want to call them. And the samples also group by the taxonomy. So the samples at this level group by taxonomy, just like the 16S samples did, 16S analysis did. So let me, sh let, me show you, let me show you what happens when we group by function. So here we're combining all references, se reference sequences, no matter what organism they're coming from, with the same function or the same inferred function, they're combined. So there's no longer taxonomic information and we're looking at the ecosystem as a bag of functions. It's the ecosystem as a whole unit. So grouping the samples, again, another principal component plot, grouping the samples, we see that the samples for health now group together. What this means is that regardless of which lactobacillus species you have, uh, if you're, as a healthy person, as a healthy individual, those lactobacilli, lactobacillus species are doing essentially the same thing uh, in, the, in the healthy individual. The BV samples still separate by function, and it's the same separation that we got by, um, uh, at the gene level. So that's, again, reassuring. It's nice and robust. The result is, is, is nice and clean and robust. The things that are invariant that are on the zero, zero point of the, of the ordination are housekeeping genes. So I just, just named some of them so that if, if, if your favorite housekeeping gene is there, you know, great. These are, the, these are the kinds of genes that you would use for standards if you were doing quantitative PCR, okay? So, you know, again, that's reassuring. If we're doing qPCR, we're gonna choose a housekeeping gene and we're gonna do everything as a reference to that and that's exactly, <laughs> to a first approximation of what we're doing here. We also have functions that are, that are um, private or highly differential between groups. So we have a, a, a set of functions that are essentially only found in the healthy group, a set of functions that are found in the BV1 and 2 group, but are uh, more prevalent in the BV2 group, and a set of functions that are only in the BV1 group. So if we do a differential abundance analysis between BV1 and BV2, what are the differences in the functions? So here is a, 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 an effect size plot. Each point is an individual function. They're grouped as to the larger functional category they belong to. And the ones that are in red or blue are ones that we would, would conclude are substantially and significantly different. The biggest difference between the groups is motility and chemotaxis. Uh, BV1 has, so these genes down here are motility, and, largely motility and chemotaxis genes. Um, and that is, so I'm showing you here, this is a multivariate ordination, and this is a differential abundance analysis using um, a differential abundance tool called ALDEX2. So we're getting, we, we're getting consistent results with, with multivariate ordination with, different, with univariate differential abundance. <clears throat> 
You just put a name on those. Uh, that group is, as I said, they're flagellar and chemotactic proteins uh, or genes, sorry, functions. We can then take those functions and break them apart in, into ref seeks again and see which taxa those functions are coming from. Um, in this same data set, we've done metabolomics. And one of the diff most differential metab metabolites that we found was four hydro uh, gamma, gamma hydroxybutyrate. Butyrate. And so doing a correlation, we see that G, G vaginalis abundance, relative abundance, correlates with GHB. We then looked in the metatranscriptome and we saw that G vaginalis has the, the key parts, the pathway that can produce GHB. And then going, looking in vivo, or sorry, in culture, uh, across uh, a series of strains uh, or a series of species that are commonly found in the vagina, we see that G vaginalis is the only one that in culture makes, um, makes GHB. So we can correlate the composition, the met metatranscriptome and the metabolome and then, and then validate that. Okay, so just to sum up now, is the microbiome analysis reproducible? Well, yes, it is if you're looking at functions and you're using compositional analysis. And this is because we're looking at properties of the entire composition, not just what is most prevalent. And I'm gonna say that these results replicate within and between labs. So we have reproduced this analysis with an independent set of samples, and we have this analysis, these, um, another lab, Jacques Revelle's lab, has also looked at uh, bacterial vaginosis and has replicated essentially exactly the same things that we found. Furthermore, we collected our samples at two different times with two, uh, and uh, did them on two different sequencing platforms. Initial samples were on an ABI solid, later samples about three years later were on an Illumina HiSeq, and the samples group by their functional composition, not by their platform. So the S samples were sequenced on solid, the other samples were sequenced on, uh, alum on, on the alumina. You can't really, you, you're not gonna see this platform independence with any other approach. Okay, so just a quick now summarize. Who's their DNA, what they're doing now, RNA, and what they have may, may or may have not done recently in terms of the small molecules, it's a little bit of a complicated relationship. Sometimes who's there, it's not, who's producing molecules and metabolites, sometimes it is, uh, it's relatively easy um, to, 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 to deconvolute. Combining these data sets is a bit of, of an open problem. The metabolome and, and, and uh, meta-RNA-seq gives us a high, re high resolution, holistic view of the complex system. They have a different resolution, but uh, in general, there's generally broad agreement. Regardless of the community members that are there, whether it's almost exclusively lactobacilli or almost exclusively anaerobic uh, anaerobes, core functions are conserved. Replication, repair, recombination, you know, uh, you know, those kinds of functions are conserved. Um, I would argue that the ecosystem is more important than any, any single organism unless you have an infectious process. And I didn't show you, but community members can cooperate, compete, or basically ignore each other. The method examines the variance, the ratios between the features, and I know that hurts everybody's head. But we have to remember that sequencing data are inherently composition. It's a political poll, not an election. We're examining variance, not abundance. So what's, what's variable between samples, not what's abundant in any one sample. And with a little bit of training, it's easy to interpret relationships between samples and features. It's very robust to perturbations. It's, you know, doesn't, you know, platform is, we can subset out different, we can remove, we can remove or add in different uh, features, different genes, different um, functions. It doesn't change the relationships between the functions that, that are in common between the subset and the, and the superset. We get the same answer whether we're doing exploratory data analysis, the multivariate ordination, differential abundance, or compositional association. Or at least we get answers that are directly relatable. And the nice thing is that if we were to count, if we were able to actually count the molecules and we used 
the, 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 the compositional approach, the variance to the ratio approach, we would get exactly the same answer to, within measurement error, whether, we've, whether we're looking at the data from the underlying environment or the data, the compositional data after sequencing. So it's directly relatable. It doesn't tell us anything about absolute abundance, but it tells us everything about relative that, uh, about the variance of the ratios of relative abundance. Um, there's a number of labs that have worked out in, um, methodologies to deal with high throughput sequencing data in this compositional uh, way. Some of them uh, by us, some of them by others. So um, uh, there's ours is composition, ours is Bioconductor, and we have CodaSeq, and then we have a, a Shiny app that my, my student has put together. Uh, there's selection of balances or the cell bell and um, methodology that just came out about a month ago. I'm not sure it's on CRAN yet. And Chime has ANCOM also built in. The, for compositional association, for correlation, the, the, to, the, the tool that's uh, best uh, is called Proper by a guy named Tom Quinn, and it's also on CRAN. So all these tools are publicly available, um, and they're uh, becoming more widely used. I just want to acknowledge Andrew Fernandez, who now works at FICO as the lead data analyst for their fraud detection unit, and Gene Macklem, who works at, uh, is a, uh, works at uh, DNA Genetech. They're the, postdoc, uh, they're the postdocs and students who uh, worked on this and got this off the ground for us. The Vera and Quanco on the, on the top right there, um, post-retirement faculty members in, uh, from Spain who worked out a lot of the uh, basic math and stats of, of these approaches in other areas. They're wonderful collaborators. Um, uh, and then Justin and Tom are actually both MD-PhD students, one in South Carolina, the other one in Australia, who I collaborate with, and, and, and we're sort of a little working group uh, working towards uh, making these things um, uh, more functional and more available to people. So that's my spiel. Sorry, I went a little bit longer than I expected but I'm happy to take any questions. Um.